what is going on podcast listeners friends family those have, that have been here since the beginning those that are tuning in for the first time today i am tuning in from puerto viejo costa rica it is the caribbean coast borders panama you can probably hear the ocean in the back and uh, the spanish-speaking woman on my left but that is uh, only for the opener not for the entire podcast i'm thrilled with how this episode turned out. We really did a deep dive into men's mental health. Um, We have a variety of topics we cover on this show from community building, leadership, communication skills, and and ultimately at the end of the day, the reason why I started this podcast and the reason why I started Circle Up was to make a conversation around men's mental health and masculinity more accessible. And I really think that's, that's what this show delivers. Um, our guest on this episode started along with his co-founders an app for peer support for men and uh, mental health called Tether. And uh, Tether has received tons of acknowledgement and uh, just playing with the system, um, reading the reviews, it's clear to me that um, they are changing the way we talk, feel, and look at men's mental health. So I could have been more proud to have someone who inspires me and is aligned with the direction that we're going down, which is instead of taking all of this baggage from the past of what men's mental mental health is and what masculinity is, and instead of inheriting that and accepting it, we can change the dialogue, we can create a designed future, we can create from possibility what we want this conversation around men's mental health to look like, which is accessible and modern um, and peer-to-peer focused and uh, focus on being there for each other and acknowledging where we're at in our lives and on our journey. So again, uh, inspired by this conversation, thrilled how it turned out. I think that really it all comes perfectly full circle in the last five minutes, so I do encourage you to listen to the full episode. We cover um, grief and heartbreak and uh, you know some of the most devastating challenges that somebody could experience, the most devastating adversity someone could go through in their lives. But um, you know, my, my guest uh, on the show was courageous and resilient um, and inspiring with his sharing. So uh, Addison, thanks for being on the show. You, I want to acknowledge you for everything you're doing in the world and all that you are in the world because this was uh, one of my favorite podcasts that I've ever done and I am pleased that uh, you listeners will be able to tune in. Welcome to this episode of the Circle of Podcast with none other than Addison Brazil. Okay, cool, man. Well, first of all, I just want to say that I really appreciate you doing this, taking the time. I admire the work you do. Um, your partner's name's Matt. Yep. Matt. Yeah, what you what you two are up to and just like kind of the vision that you have. When I sent that email, I was really intentional with the subject line of a design future. And I really see that as what you two are up to is, um, you know, masculinity has been talked about in a certain lens and it has a lot of baggage. And I like the I like the idea of something out of nothing mm-hmm. rather than trying to, you know, more fit it's just like okay if we were to create a clean slate and create it from scratch create it from possibility what could masculinity look like what could men's mental health look like what could like what you're up to and what we're doing at circle level could peer support look like and so uh I'm, I'm just excited to to chat with you man i think what you're doing is inspiring and i think you you too and and the brand is gonna continue to grow and continue to blow up so just happy to be part of the the journey for y'all um so i appreciate that yeah, of course, man. And uh, to kick it off, uh, we'll just start with a brief check-in, just because I did a you know two-second intro of who you are before um, jumping into the show, so our listeners could get to know you a little bit better. So, um, you know, just really briefly, um, check-in will be um, just you know your name and who you are. Feel free to approach that however you like. And then the check-in question is, what are you most excited about in your life right now? And just to give you a brief example, I'll start. My name is Jonathan. Um, Who I am is uh, somebody that cares about men's mental health and somebody that wants to be a positive role model for men seeking support when they need it, for men that are struggling, 
to give them an opportunity where they don't have to feel like they're alone. Because if there's one thing that I've learned from being part of men's circles is that we have virtually all of the same challenges, just a different flavor. Um, and so when we, when we do come together and when we can create a safe space for conversation, we really realize that we're, we're at the same table and we're dealing with the same challenges. And so when we could do it together, we're a lot stronger. Um, that's, that's, that's what I care about. Um, that's who I am. And what I'm most excited about is I'm in uh, Puerto Viejo, Costa Rica right now. I'm backpacking with my best friend and my business partner and I'm having the time of my life. And there's nothing I'd rather be doing right now than uh, adventuring. Amazing. Um, I don't know if I can beat that, but um, <laughs> my name is Addison Brazil. Brazil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, yeah, I'm Addison Brazil. And um, above all else, I would describe myself as somebody who's taken a lot of time and energy into processing and, and surviving traumatic events uh, in my 20s and figuring out how those can best become supportive opportunities, both for myself and others. Um, and most recently, as a creator and a connector that has been in my project with my co-founders, uh, Matt Zerker and Burke White, um, on Tether, which is um, an app for men's mental health and well-being. So obviously, we're quite aligned uh, with the same mission and, and um, you know, really starting to shift what this idea of masculinity is and normalizing um, man's, you know, ability to speak about how they're really feeling. Um, and then what I'm most excited about right now, um, I would just say that the, the fact that I'm in flow, um, it's taken me a long time um, and a lot of energy to sort of find out what that means to me and and how, how that can feel, sort of to not be in response just to an event or something that's happened, but to actually be in flow of the present moment. Um, I'm very excited that that's happening for me because there's definitely points, which I'm sure we'll get to in my journey, where I didn't think that I was going to find flow, um, like this at least. Um, and I, I feel very much in alignment and flow, and so I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, well, thanks for helping me kick this off. In terms of um, flow and doing things you're excited about, I wanted to start the show by reading something. I'm not sure who wrote it, but it's on the, the Tether website, and it seems to be part of your, your brand and your mission statement. Um, it says, we are changing the face of masculinity by letting every man know that struggling doesn't make you any less of a man. It simply makes you human. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about um, how you and your team came to that? Because I think it's um, an inspiring anchor to kick this off by. It doesn't make you less of a man if you struggle. It just makes you human. I think that's beautiful and well said. And, and I was wondering if you'd elaborate on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, one of our, our biggest missions, I guess you could say, when, when Heather was being approached and Matt, my, my co-founder, you know, he, he was the one who originally came up with the idea and we sort of, um, all the three of us came together, me coming in to build the brand and the community, Burke coming in um, on a technical side and, um, and then Matt with this vision and this dream of really starting to shift um, this view of masculinity. And it really was born out of Matt's primarily and then, you know, all of our, our relationships with sort of being a man in our 20s and sort of trying to figure everything out and being up against this idea of what that is, even if it's in our own heads. Um, and obviously there's this preconceived notion of, of what a man is and isn't and what he should and shouldn't do. And both in our own journeys and in the men that were around us when we started to join men's groups and do men's circles and, and do all these things that started to really shift our lives, we noticed how much of a barrier that is for guys in general. Um, and that, you know, there's this idea of even though we're in 2020, at the time 2020, now 2021, and you think like, come on, we got to move past that. So many men are still carrying this socialized idea of, you know, I need to be strong and a provider and not feel and crying or talking about emotions makes me less of a man um, and makes it seem like I have it less together and I'm less capable at, at doing what I should be doing. Um, and uh, it was robbing 
a lot of people, including ourselves, of purpose and meaning. And so when we when we came together and we really started to build the brand and look at it, this the sentence that you chose to, to write is something that's really like a guidepost for us and just like our, our biggest kind of shout out to the world of, of what we're trying to say is just, you know, we inherently think of struggle or negative emotions as good or bad. Um, and, and really what, what I've done in all my work in my whole life, but specifically with Tether is trying to look at getting away from good or bad and, and move towards the truth. Just what's the truth of the situation and finding comfort and security um, in any gender uh, or any identification in expressing that and knowing that it can be received safely. Um, and um, obviously, you know, when we sat down, this is pre-COVID and we were looking at statistics that, that were saying that 77% of men were dealing with some sort of stress, anxiety, or depression. Uh, and that 40% of men were saying that they wouldn't ask for help unless they were feeling suicidal or planning self-harm. So we noticed this gap in that where you're going, well, if you look at the suicide rates, which is 75 to 80% of suicides are men, um, how many are asking for help at all? And what's really going on here? Um, and the idea of putting a usable, applicable tool in a man's back pocket where there's 24 hour, seven hour access to peer support, other men um, who are just like them, kind of was the seed of Matt's idea and we've done everything we can to make sure that exists. And obviously in Tether and in both app stores, it, it does today um, in its current form. So um, yeah, that's, it's, that sentence, you know, that, that part that you read from the website is, has remained a guiding post of everything we do every day um, for sure. Can you talk to me about, um, as you began this journey, I know you have your own story and I, and I wanna make sure we get into um, some of the events that happened in your life that brought you to this place. Before we get into that, you mentioned some statistics, like as an example, 75% of suicides are men. And that's something that I talk about in Circle Up all the time, which is if we don't start having a conversation, if we don't open up a dialogue, we're gonna get a predictable, almost certain future right? It's yeah. going gonna, gonna to perpetuate. It's going to be continuously ongoing. And so it, we need to do something different in order to have a different future. And so 75% of suicides, when I think of that, it just seems like it's totally um, something that we need, to, we need to do something about. We need to take action on. We need to have this conversation and open it up. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, what is it about a man struggling that they feel that like they can't reach out to support. Why, why is it that we only, one of the stats was that um, someone that's in a crisis only feels like they have zero people to talk to or one person to talk to. Why, what is it about us that we haven't come to a place where we can create these relationships? You know what, I think it's, and I, I always love to talk about this and, and Matt's so well versed on this topic. And so I'm always continually learning from him and, and all the experts around us, but you know, even in my upbringing, which I would say was like very um, modern and liberal, you know, parents, I still inherited this, this belief. And I, I did it with success. I didn't do it with like, you know, machoism and like stoicism, but, but like, I definitely wanted to put something ahead of my emotions. And, and even looking at that, like, you just see in the more men that you talk to, there's sort of this inherent learning that, that we shouldn't feel and we shouldn't cry. And you know, sh showing that you don't have emotions is perceived as strength. I mean, it just is. And, and you know, we've seen that, and yes, like we've come such a long way and that's really starting to be broken down. But you know, there's another study that, that was always very interesting to us when we created the brand um, by a man named Dr. Kimmel. And it, it, he, he found that 93% of men don't actually agree or align with how masculinity is portrayed in the media and the outer world 93 percent of men so basically all of us don't agree with this idea yeah virtually um, everybody yet we're putting this this boundary around being that man or not being that man um and, and so of course we're starting to see more and more um you know acceptance and diversity and and everything but i think that it's a little bit too of the feeling of a little it was a little too late to ask 
like you feel silly wanting to go back to something that seems basic to other people. And I think there's a little shame around that and, and it just sort of gets closed off. And, um, you know, and those statistics end up the way that they are when, when you're not taking care of your mental health. Um, you know, obviously just as a peer, which is, you know, first and foremost, what I always want to say is like, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a researcher. I'm, you know, I, I when I looked at where I was in my own life track, I had the intellect to maybe go and do that if that's where I wanted to take this. But it became very important to me, and we'll get into my story, in my story that I remained one of the guys, that I remained a peer, because I wanted to make sure that I knew how far that could be taken, that you didn't have to have an MD in order to know how to take care of yourself as a man when it came to your mental health. Uh, I wanted to be a part of the every man. And, and when Matt came up with Tether, my biggest draw to it was that I wanted it to exist for myself. Um, and that, that was kind of my pull in. And, and the other side of that is when I looked back at what was different for me and that with everything that I've been through, you know, where's the glue? How do I still end up here a decade later with the struggles that I've been through? And it was just community. It was something that I had. And, and if I could find a way to cultivate and create that for everyone who doesn't have it, like the statistics show, um, then yeah, that's what I would want, you know, sort of my life to be about and what I would like to do for the next year and a half at the time. Yeah, there seems to be a common theme between uh, the men I admire who have a sense of purpose and a sense of meaning in their lives where based off their life experience, they are scratching their own itch in a way. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I wish I would have had this or this would have been really useful for me or if it exists now, I'd be able to use it right now. And so that's how I felt when I started Circle Up, which was like, you know, the conversation for young men like my friends. Um, how do I initiate that so that if I need it, right, if I need a buddy to call and talk to about what I'm struggling with, you know, is that available? Will it be accessible? And so, you know, we started Circle Up. It sounds like that's kind of what's happened for you with Tether. Like I think of my favorite musicians. One of my favorite musicians is a guy uh, named FKJ. He's just like so talented. And uh, he said, I couldn't find the music I wanted to listen to. Mm. And so I made it, right? Yeah. And so um, I, I'd love to dive into to chatting a little bit about um, men struggling because one of the concepts that we talk about in Circle Up, it's something that I'm writing in the Circle Up book, is about arrows. And uh, just as a, an, an analogy, talking about um, you know, men being warriors, and on the battlefield of your life, you're going to experience hardship and adversity, and it's going to look different for every man, but taking an arrow is inherent of being a warrior, otherwise you weren't on the battlefield, right? right. And so taking an arrow isn't actually the challenge the challenge is is when that happens what do you do about it when that happens is there a community there to help you heal and to remove it and to get strong again so you can go back out and fight and one of the challenge seems to be is that when men take arrows we don't acknowledge them we let them remain um and it, it, it you know you bleed out man and it gets it gets heavier over time and it weakens your spirit as a warrior. Um, one of the things that really I am most inspired by you is that you're openly talking about challenges that you're experiencing, uh, that you have experienced, and that really paves the way for other men to feel confident that they can do the same thing. And so I'm wondering, can you talk to me a little bit about your brother? Because yeah, um, when when I heard of when I heard that story, um, I couldn't imagine. So yeah, I you would um, a little bit about that. Yeah, and then, uh, I just want to say too that that the metaphor you used is a very powerful metaphor, and then to also say thank you for acknowledging that I talk about it, and I, I just want to normalize that that it's it's a practice, and it took a long time, um, so long in fact. Uh, my brother, um, gosh. Tell you about my brother well um my brother let's just say that like my brother is just like one of those people that just knew what he was doing with his time on earth um he just he just had this soul where he was so easily able to connect with so many people and he had friends of all ages and he just was never afraid to put him out, himself out there to express what he was feeling to you know make a joke even if it was a bad joke um, you know, that, that was my brother. And, and 
to give you contrast, growing up, I was sort of like always to the side of that, thinking like in some way that it was inappropriate or he was bothering people or like, you know, it's like, stop, 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 you know. Um, and my brother, uh, when when I was, uh, I would have been 16 and, and he was 13, he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumor. And our relationship as, you know, brothers that are only two years apart throughout high school was obviously drastically changed um, as he navigated surgeries, chemo, radiation, you know, living in and out of the hospital. Um, and, and it just was so interesting during those formative years to sort of learn so much from a younger brother, but then try to maintain the role of an older brother. And in some parts, in some ways, sort of a patriarch within my family. Um, but um, yeah, it, it was something that, again, like I said, I, I internalized and then I turned into action. So uh, my brother had shown interest in helping other families uh, that had children with brain tumors like him um, towards the end of his journey. And, um, and so I sort of took that seed and, and decided to build Team Brother Bear, which is a foundation organization in memory of my brother that actually did start um, with him. My brother, as his uh, condition got worse and worse, he got down to just thumbs up and thumbs down. Uh, and so a lot of the pillars of the charity, he got to go to the first two events um, and was honored at both of them. But a lot of, of what we built, I would sort of bring to his hospital bed and, and it would be built off a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Um, and uh, so that's why you'll see like in the charity pictures, we always kind of do the thumbs up uh, whenever we were at the hospital or, or presenting a check or, or whatever it is that we're doing honoring a family. Um, and uh, yeah, in September of 2008, my brother passed um, and I was 19 at the time, um, just about to turn 20 and my first year of school, just finished my first year of school, uh, college. And, um, and yeah, I just had this front row seat to watching everybody and especially the men in my family navigate this intense grief process of this child passing, um, especially my father, um, but just everybody. And it, it just, you really realize that grief, even if everyone's grieving the same person, everybody has such a unique relationship with that person. So everybody has such a different process. And so there really is no, and you know, as we will probably get to in my story, I, I'm a little bit of a specialist on grief, unfortunately, in my story. Um, but, you know, what I really realized is no two things work for the same person and grieving the person isn't the same grief. Um, you know, even my, me and my siblings have very different processes. Uh, of course, my mother lost a child. I lost my only brother. Like it was just so very different. And, um, and it, it just became kind of paramount to us, even within our close family, um, how everyone had very specific needs and if we were going to sort of all survive and hopefully thrive we would have to tend to those needs even if it means sort of distancing from each other a little bit and um i will say that my brother inspired such a huge larger community and we i was so well supported in starting the foundation and so well supported throughout all of his illness and and with retrospect i i get to say now like his death in some ways was so beautiful um, it really was and, and what it inspired and, and what it brought together both in my family and in the greater community and how it still to this day kind of lives on in a legacy for the families that it were affiliated with at the hospital in Toronto. Um, you know, it's, it's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to explain and it's hard to know in some ways sort of as the chairman of the charity, as a mental, men's mental health advocate, but then also just as a brother and a human at at any given point on any interview, I, I never know which, which part of that is going to be the most important to me to share um, and, and trying to find balance around that and making sure that, you know, I also really don't eulogize my brother. He was a human being with faults and flaws and we fought and, you know, we laughed and we cried and, you know, all those normal things. And, and, um, and yeah, it's just, it's not something that you get over, and this is something I find myself with Tether constantly saying to men, is I spent so much time in my journey over the last 10 years trying to get fixed. And 
if I could go back and tell myself anything, it's just that it's, it's not about fixing anything. It's about honoring the journey. It's you know, honoring the full journey of it. Um, because you'll just, I literally did, uh, which we may or may not get into, go to the ends of the world to fix yourself. Um, and uh, there's, there's nothing to be fixed, but there, there certainly is a lot to be honored. And you need a safe space to do that, which goes into what we're talking about. And a lot of men feeling like they don't have uh, a safe space to do that. Yeah, thank you for thanks for sharing um, your your story about thanks. your brother. Uh, it's it's fun to 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 hear about like the dynamics of uh, sibling relationships because although m my sister and I and my brother and I are very similar, we're also like completely opposite in so many different respects. But uh, and I think it's um, beautiful. One of one of my mentors, uh, his son passed away. Uh, he committed suicide. He when he was in university. And he started, um, Eric Windler, the founder of Jack.org, along with his family, hmm. started uh, the charity based off his, his son's death and, and the difference that they've made by finding meaning inside mm -hmm. of uh, tragedy in the same way that you were able to do that with the foundation for your brother, finding some meaning, finding some silver lining. Uh, like you were saying, honoring the journey, honoring, yeah, honoring that situation, um, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's it's uh, very heartwarming. Um, but I can also just uh, my heart goes out to you and your family for for losing losing your brother. Thanks. I'm sure he was a an incredible man, um, so young. I'm I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, you know, before we before we move on from that, can you just talk to me a little bit more about what you mean by honoring? The journey because you mentioned yeah. that you were you were thinking about fixing um and 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 that that re i relate to that a lot where yeah and, and thinking and, about and I'm sure that so many men do i'll tell you like i mean in the tether community that's something that's really resonated and it's sort of my like you know mantra honor the journey is i find myself saying that to men too many times and and what a lot of that is is you know on one hand it's you know like we talked about having that perfection kind of mindset of there's something wrong with me and there's something that can fix it. And if I do enough or I do something or I find something that I'll be fixed. And there's a real trap in that, especially for men uh, in this idea of finding a quick fix rather than going through the mud of a situation. And the other part of it is, is that, you know, on, I purposely say honor the journey and I mean the journey as in every part of it. And I always say this to people whenever, whenever somebody passes or people come to me and they say, you know, so-and-so just lost someone, I just don't even know what to say, or can you talk to them? And it's like, what would you say? And I find myself saying this, you know, honor the journey, meaning if you feel like laughing, laugh. If you feel like crying, cry. If you feel like screaming, scream. Express and feel whatever it is that the journey brings you. And, and try to stay away from, again, this idea of what the journey is supposed to be and how you're supposed to behave and how you're supposed to heal. Because weirdly enough, you know, that's, the healing process is when you allow it and when you honor it more than ever. And sometimes, you know, that can take so long. Um, it's there's no finite number of men's group therapy. You know, it's not something that gets fixed, especially when it comes to grief. But I think mental health in general, it, it's not something we fix. It's something we honor. And when I say that, what I mean is that I didn't get better and then now I'm able to run an app and be writing a book and be producing yes. the film that we did like you know I, I didn't get better and it's it's a daily relationship I wake up every day and I recognize and acknowledge my relationship with the grief processes that I have and my own mental health and then I make decisions and I activate or deactivate certain things in order to be a part of that and be in flow with that on a daily basis there's no day where I'm better and you know th that's one of the funny things about time heals all wounds I I disagree respectfully um, I don't think it I think I think time allows you the opportunity to honor all wounds and to live with them and, and still be a part of it but um, I, I think so many people are sort of in a, a waiting period of oh this will go away if I ignore it or if I push it down like you were saying and um, if I can do anything as a peer is just say, if, you know, 
if you want to expedite, uh, it's actually probably best to just go through, <laughs> you know, get, get muddy right away um, and just allow whatever that experience is to be what it is. Yeah, um, one of my close friends, Jose Peranian, uh, has a, uh, a stutter that he was born with and, it, and he uses a breathing technique to be able to overcome the stutter but it's a lifelong journey that he's dealt with. And some days it's, it's a lot easier for him. Some days it's very challenging and difficult for him. Like I remember seeing him in the streets of Toronto, like literally walk up to strangers as a way of practicing, talking to people and overcoming the fear of, of talking to people because he, the, the looks he gets and the judgment that he receives is um, overwhelming sometimes. But one of my favorite quotes from him, because he's now gone on to really, um, like face his fear literally by becoming a public speaker with a, mm -hmm. with a stutter becoming a public speaker. Like really, can you imagine that? Like of all the things yeah. that he could decide to do, that's what he decided to do. But he says um, the, the best way out of fear is through. And so mm -hmm. this exact process of honoring what you're going through um, in our men's circles, we talk about, it's just a, it's just a symbol. It's just pointing at the word actually isn't that important. It, the word mask, we talk about masks. And if you're wearing a mask in the grieving process, then you're not actually honoring the emotion that you're feeling or the thoughts that you're having because you're essentially, you know, for lack of a better word, you're bullshitting yourself about where you're at. Um, and so one of the things that we aspire towards in our men's circle is creating an environment where men feel confident enough that the space is non-judgmental, that the space is confidential, where they can take their mask off and now honor the truth of where they're at in their lives. And for you, it sounds like in this grieving process, if you don't honor where you're at, then, then uh, it just sounds like you're going to be, you know, avoiding the, the real crux of the issue and never really overcome it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think a lot of us have a tendency to create smaller problems to focus on um, over the, the bigger problem. That, that we know we're, we're up against. Uh, and I think that's a very easy trap, especially again, you know, for men, 100%, um, just, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to do. And, and the biggest part of this is not whether or not you're doing it right or wrong, but to be gentle and, you know, approach your grief with the same love that you would approach a friend going through that same situation. Um, and just, um, just surrender to that the idea that you know there is not a finite date or a way to be fixed but you know just a process to start honoring it for the long haul um, I think yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because at this point this concept of like treat yourself as if it was someone you loved or treat yourself as if it was your you know a friend that you were trying to help it's almost become cliche at this point and yet there's so much truth to that, that there's a reason it's become cliche. And I really am my biggest critic. Like I really am harder on myself than anybody else is. And the conversation that I'm having with myself recently is Jonathan, how do you be more gentle with yourself? How do you spend more time um, in relaxation rather than feeling like you need to have so much output or productivity? Cause like when I'm doing those things and I'm rushing and I'm feeling like I need to do something, then I, I'm not paying attention to how I truly feel. I'm not honoring what I, what I, what would actually be in my best interest to do in this moment. But instead I'm doing, I'm taking action based off an expectation of what I think I need to do or should be doing versus what would be best for me in this right. moment. And you know, it's interesting that you say that because that's, that's such a barrier that I noticed from men as, as I've, been lucky enough to build this brand and, and sort of create the safe space like you're talking about this container for men to practice this emotional resilience and it's it's funny because a lot of people will jump to uh he needs to work on talking about his feelings or i i i can't talk to people about my feelings but there's a whole free you know section before that where you where you learn to just acknowledge feelings and so when you go on the app and you know you we give you the emotional literacy tool of being able to go through and pick how you're feeling and then check in. But even that, to just like you're saying, the conversations you're having with yourself, where you just spend time alone, where you allow yourself to check in 
as an emotional being, you know, and just accept I'm feeling this, I'm feeling that and, and start the process of acknowledging, accepting that that's ever changing, you know, that it's not a finite thing. And it's, it's not going to be a finite thing if you have a certain career or a certain job or certain, you know, it's, it's never finite. And the more you check in in a day with yourself, the more you realize it's ever changing. And of course, there's so much release in that, especially as other men around you are doing it. And I, I don't think I said this earlier, but a lot of the research, you know, we work with Heads Up Guys, um, that's based out of Canada, which is November funded. And you know, so much of the research suggests that, that the reason that men don't uptake in mental health services is they, they like behavior to be modeled for them by other men. That's how they're likely to convert into trust. So this idea in like in the circles like you're talking about and and in our app, when they see it normalized around them, something truly starts to shift that makes it okay. But there's it's not jumping straight to being in a place where you can talk to anyone about your feelings at any moment. It's not, you know, we have that tendency to make it about somebody else. Like I'll be able to do that for somebody else, but really it starts with ourselves. Like you're saying, and my greatest critics and my greatest challenges all lie within myself too. I don't think either of us are sort of special for that. I think every man listening to this is probably nodding, being like, yeah, I'm yeah, really hard <laughs> on myself. Like it's the, the easiest person to attack in the world. So I like that you said that because, you know, it does sound cliche, but like, no, really, man, like, would you ever say what you just said to yourself in your head to your best friend? No, like you, that's not the advice you would give logically, loving like that's just not what would be said so what would be said and and how much of that are you willing to receive from yourself in these conversations with yourself and that's that's something that that takes practice and like I said like that's why we do like the one word check-ins daily like just normalizing the idea of being this living breathing person <laughs> that has a full spectrum of emotions and there's no weirdness or shame around that you know yeah, I think the one word check in is a great idea. And uh, another example of how we use that in our circle is um, because we tend to be a little emotionally constipated sometimes, and maybe we haven't fine tuned understanding and recognizing where we're at as much as we could and we should practice and move towards that. Um, sometimes a number system works well as well, like one to 10, how's it going? And we typically check in in all of our men's circle meetings with a one to 10. And, um, you know, you, you get a, a handle on uh, men over time of how they're doing. Like some check in at an eight every week or a nine every week. And then if they do check in at a seven or if they do check in at a six, then there is cause for and reason for pausing and stopping and saying, okay, well, what's up? And, right. uh, and giving them the space and opportunity to be able to air that and, um, you know, sometimes we call it mudroom where we don't even um, ask them questions about it. It's just talking about it is helpful mm -hmm. and there's no problem solving. Mudroom is like an analogy where you walk into the house and instead of bringing all the mud into the, into the house, you would just, you know, bang your shoes off in the, in, the, in the room before going inside. So we just air all of that prior to going into the work, into the meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, we would dive deeper into it if if a man was a four or a three and there was reason to do that but uh, i really like that one word check-in another way we do that is a you know one to ten number system give them an opportunity right. to be able Absolutely. to chat about that um i, I do want to cover um you know a little bit more about your story because um your brother um wasn't the only reason why uh, tether is something that's important to you i know we talked about suicide on the show already 75 percent of suicides are men some of the men in my life that are closest to me my best friend my roommate my business partner lost his dad to suicide when he was a when he was a, a boy um mm. one of the friends that we just spent five weeks with in santa teresa costa rica um him he was there with his sister and uh, their brother wasn't with them but i know their family well and they lost their father to suicide mm. a couple of years ago um you had a you have a similar experience yeah absolutely and you know to yeah kind of continue like from with my brother again and to tie this into men's mental health as well at the same time you know when my brother you always hear like the, you know the statement if if i ever lost my child i die or you know like people just like that is not possible and obviously you know we had to live through the experience of finding that it's very much possible for you know parents to lose children um, and 
I'll admit, like I had all eyes, as many people did in our greater community, on my mom and how this would affect my mom and if she would ever be the same again and if she would be able to, you know, be. Um, and so much, so much energy was put on that. And, you know, my dad, when I think back to it, it it's like he just, he really did sort of always portray the idea of masculinity that we talked about earlier. I mean, he, he was, you know, and, and I wouldn't consider him like the stoic, you know, my dad was like very loving and very emotional and all that stuff, but at the same time, very much found his purpose and meaning in providing and for securing and for protecting. And whether it sounds a little bit insane or not, I think that he thought he could somehow protect my brother from what he had to go through. And, um, and my, my dad, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as aware of his mental health journey. And it was something that my mom always spoke about. So we were always aware and, you know, and in, in retrospect now seeing that, like how little communication there was around it, you used to think if someone's not talking about it, then they're fine. But if they're talking about it all the time, like pay more attention. But actually I can see now, and obviously in retrospect that you're in a much healthier place when you're able to discuss your highs and lows you know, ongoing versus sort of, well, they seem to be fine because they're not saying anything. Um, and um, to be honest, because of where masculinity and mental health and how those conversations tied in with my dad's, you know, Portuguese Catholic upbringing and wanting to appear as like, you know, a strong father and, and not put the pressure of discussing his own mental health on his children. Um, to be honest, I don't know, you know, if, if in 2021, my dad would say, I've struggled with blank for the last 10 years, he probably would. He'd probably be able to identify what anxiety or depression were in a very different way and have the literacy to say, you know, or I'd have the ability to have acknowledged it and then gone, okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, at that time, um, I didn't have, you know, sort of any idea really, uh, unless things, things seemed to be really bad, which, which they didn't often. Um, and my dad and I were, we both had to sort of make sense of our life again after losing my brother, Austin. And to be perfectly honest, we, we bashed heads in that a little bit for a little while too. Um, so there was just a lot around, weirdly enough, and I'm not just tying this into the conversation, but just what it meant to be a man and what was important to both of us. And, and that clashing was something that I just, I needed to step away from for a little while. And I did. Um, and then when, when I, when I kind of came back to it, my dad had just uh, recently gone through his second divorce. So now he had lost my brother um, and then his second marriage had ended. Um, and, um, and we sort of reconnected. And um, for the first time in my whole life, it just really felt like we were equals and it was different. And um, we, we were best buds. Um, literally he learned to text and my phone never stopped going off and I'll go over there all the time. And, you know, it was just, it was really nice to get to know him in that way. And it was for the first time in life where there was sort of no uh, financial responsibility for me, you know, as an adult at the time, I'd already worked professionally, finished school um, and just happened that I was back in Toronto during this time. And so it's just really interesting to get to know him. And um, I went on a trip um, and I came back and when I came back, something just seemed really off and, um, I, I didn't know again, it's so hard not to place my current education on where I was at the time, but at the time it just seemed something was really off and I sort of had a very spidey sense feeling that something was not right. And this, my dad wasn't my dad. I just could tell like there was a light that was missing and it really, really, really frightened me. And, um, you know, I did all the things I knew how well respecting what he was saying to me, which was that he was going through a tough time. He had decided to go on antidepressants and that there would be sort of a, you know, a dip and then he would be better. And he, he didn't want me to see him that way. Um, but it just really freaked me out. So we came to a deal where I was sort of checking in on him twice a day. And if that check-in didn't happen, that I would no longer respect his Yes, man, because it, you know, I just, I, I felt very odd um, about it all. And, um, you know, it just, um, it's so funny, I always get to this point in the story where I try to figure out how to make it an hour till I tell you what happens next, or 
if I can just tell you. But long story short, in a very quick amount of time from when I came back from that trip to just two weeks later, um, I found my father after his suicide. And um, I just, I mean, at that point, my whole entire life just was different. I mean, it just, I couldn't process any of it it didn't make any sense to me and and then on top of it there was losing a father and there was understanding how, you know so much about suicide but then also the trauma of, of finding someone by suicide and of course a huge trigger warning here and i apologize and i say it maybe we can put it in the notes um but um yeah i just um it just there's nothing that's going to make you question what it is to be a man to be a father to be on earth than having this person that you had this perceived idea would always above all else be there to protect you and love you and you know to sort of i mean you know i was the only one with a key to my dad's house so like to you know it just felt you know sometimes when i try to explain it to normal people i'm like have you ever been ghosted uh <laughs> after a date it's kind of like that times a million um and uh that's where my mental health journey really picked up that's where it really became full time i never had any intention of of sort of focusing on mental health overly just you know tending to my own and um i i had very bad ptsd very bad compounded grief at that point that i was struggling with uh, i was having flashbacks and a lot of trauma symptoms and i got um very unwell and uh was felt a little bit like i was racing against time to kind of find wellness again and um that really took me to so many experiences i mean you name it i've tried it sort of around the world as far as you know therapy and peer groups and alternative treatments and holistic treatments and you know different types of medicine and and, and i just um really 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 wanted to find normalcy and the odd thing was, is during this time where I've never felt worse, I was in the process of applying for my extraordinary artist visa in the States so that I could move to California. And so I was in this really weird juxtaposition of spending my days sort of proving in paperwork that I was extraordinary. Um, you know, those who are listening, I have air quotes around that, um, you know, and never feeling less extraordinary, um, you know, at the same time. And it Came, it came to a point where I did get the visa and I did succeed in that and was so great because it was sort of this opening to sort of starting again and starting anew. And, um, and yeah, I came to California and sort of really tried to, you know, form my own identity that wasn't around sort of these two great losses in a small town that everybody was aware of, you know, it's, I was the third Brazil boy, the, the, the one who lived at this point. It was just very weird and isolating and none of my friends at that time, like I didn't know anybody who had been through what I had been through. Um, and again, like I said about grief, it's the same for trauma. Finding somebody else who's been through trauma isn't always necessarily therapeutic or helpful because it's so specific. And um, I don't think you'd mind me sharing this, but my best friend since I was born, our mothers were best friends, we were like cousins. Uh, we both lost our father the exact same way um, within two and a half years of part of each other. And there was more, nothing more isolating than realizing that we, that we didn't have the same experience, even though we had had sort of the same experience, you know, that we, that we would still have to deal with it on our own and in so many different ways. Um, and a lot of that too got tied up in, you know, his, his view of masculinity and, and who he was as a man and how much he wanted to share and express and go into the mud, you know, like we said, and versus mine. And, and I realized, you know, you have to seek out a community of men, you know, it's not going to get closer than your best friend having the same experience as you. You, you really are going to have to work to find other men who are comfortable and will create a safe space and allow sort of the truth of what's happened to exist. And, um, and so I had a lot of opportunities like that to see the polarization of, of obviously like my dad's like the, the biggest sort of image for me of men's mental health in a way, but then also my journey from that point. And the one thing that I, that I always take away from that is that in a way, perhaps 
genetically and statistically, like I was on a similar path to my father with where my mental health was 10 years ago. But if nothing else, like I inherited the absolute, you know, privilege of getting an education on mental health and how, how important it has to be and, and, um, and just, you know, normalizing, talking about it and sharing um, your story when it, when it's, it's your strength, it's what, what you have to offer, you know? Yeah, that's the word that comes to mind for me, man. Is I just want to say I'm sorry that you um, experienced all of that, first of all. So Absolutely. my, my yeah. heart goes out to you and, you and your family again. Like, I just think about my relationship with my dad and, um, you know, he's the, one of the most important men in my life. And obviously you felt the same way about your dad and you were getting even closer over time. Um, so like just your, your strength and your courage and your bravery. Um, Thank you. And, uh, and, and then the other thing that I want to acknowledge is, you know, you're, you're telling the story and the more I hear the story, the more it, it becomes crystal clear that it's not uh, some exception, mm. right? I remember experiencing depression in high school, um, being diagnosed with clinical depression, um, getting an anxiety diagnosis, being on antidepressants. And I had a lot of shame coming out of that um, because of so many reasons I felt like, you know, why, why did I experience this given that other people's circumstances are so challenging? And, um, and I realized that, that it was actually a useful story to tell, that it wasn't some you know, niche, nuanced um, situation. It was like anybody could have gone through what I went through. And the more that I learned about men's mental health, the more I realized you know, what you just experienced, what you just talked to our, our listeners about is happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah. how, is this, how is this happening so much? Yeah, I mean, it, it It really is. And it's, it's going to take, you know, a lot of effort and time and conscious, you know, behavior with things like, you know, circle up and tether and, you know, all of all of our energy to really start to bring these numbers down. Um, and, and so much of that is, is, you know, what we're doing is creating culture. And I love that, like, also that you said that because, you know, for the longest time, I didn't, I felt weird about telling anybody that my dad had gone on antidepressants, uh, you know, like, because he wouldn't want me to say that. And it's like, now I'm at a point where, you know, this is obviously about my piece, but how can that not be one of his greatest gifts that he left was like that, that even then, even though it was hidden in some ways, he was asking for help. He was reaching out. And even then, you know, it was, it was maybe too late or whatever it was. I don't pretend to know. Um, because as we know, suicide is just such a, a mystery, really, because we don't get to speak to anybody who, who has died that way. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's definitely something where even I, as I go through my own story, each time I realize like how just by doing the practice of sharing, just the practice of talking like I have doing different podcasts and you know, interviews and, and the writing stuff that I've done, you know, I realize like, oh, like, oh, you're you let that out a little bit easier this time. Like you're not being protective of that, of the very thing that we're out to defeat, this idea of masculinity and how much I should or shouldn't share, even when I'm sharing about men's mental health, you know? So it's always there. It's kind of the same thing where it's not something that disappears and gets fixed, but you know, it's something that, you know, brick by brick, um, I find that I'm able to normalize. And that's a very normal thing. My father was struggling with his mental health and he decided to get medicated and went to a doctor. Like, it's just, you know, the fact that saying that 10 years ago was somehow shameful. The fact that there were whispers of conversations about whether or not we just say it was a heart attack at the Catholic funeral. You know, that, that to me, on one hand, could be something that I could dwell on and become, you know, upset about. But on the other hand, the fact that, that, that none of that would even cross my mind 10 years later, in this, you know, the people that I've surrounded with and the way that this movement has started to move, it also gives me a lot of hope because my dad did not die of suicide in the world that we're in right now, 100%, you know? Um, like, 
you know, I mean, just the access of younger guys like you and me doing what we do, you know, it just, it wasn't normalized. It just, it wasn't there. So things are moving and things are shifting. And, and I, you know, my greatest hope is that we start to see that statistically, you know, and obviously that's one of Tether's biggest missions is to see that needle move. And, you know, obviously Movember is doing everything they can to reduce, you know, there's, there, there's so much more power being put into reducing this number. I mean, I believe that it's the highest killer of men under 45 in the United States. I believe a doctor told me that just this week and I have to double check that, but you know, that's, that's a lot, yeah. that's a lot of men, you know? So it's definitely yeah. something to think about and talk about and, and find ways to sort of normalize without, without it getting too heavy too, because we all have to find our balance and, you know, you can't take all of it on either. So, um, you know, anywhere before, I always thought I would sort of start some sort of mental health charity or foundation or, or do something in memory of my father. But to be honest, anywhere before, maybe like the three months before Tether was started, it sort of would have been for the wrong reasons. And I'm so grateful that I was able to approach this in such a different way. And, and I, if I can, like just to segue that, like the biggest the biggest part of that for me was that I had never felt depressed. I had never really felt like other than in reaction to life events, I had never felt, you know, that, that I had any sort of imbalance or that, you know, I, I was down without reasoning or whatever it was, you know, the questions the doctors would ask me, it was always in relation to, well, yeah, of course I'm upset or of course, you know, my, my dad's gone or my brother's gone. Um, but I did um, sort of on the cusp of, of, of going to the end of the earth, like I said, and starting to thrive again. And I met um, my mentor and coach and started to work with her and, and things were just really shifting and people just saw light in my eyes again and they were telling me and celebrating. Um, I, um, I, I went out with a friend to sort of celebrate with her and uh, on the way home we were in a fatal accident that, that killed my dear friend and left me relearning to walk and I was hospitalized for a month and then the recovery and, oh, sure. and a brain injury and um, when I started to experience on top of everything I had been through, the chronic pain and that experience at that time was the first time in my life I actually entered a suicidal depression. And all I can explain from that time is that I just felt like I knew I wasn't safe, but at the same time, logically, I knew that I was the only one that was going to take that action, you know, in essence. And so I actually agreed after sort of being this kind of co-parent from birth to finally just be a child. And I went and I literally, you know, with all my doctor's help and all my, you know, everybody, coach, every friends, everybody were aware. And I went and I literally let my mom babysit me for a month because I didn't trust myself. Uh, and when I got there and my mom couldn't just make it better by being my mom, um, you know, this, this feeling really set in. And um, I remember just like being in in the bedroom and my mom being in the other room and just crying and crying as quietly as I could because I felt so bad that I was thinking about ending my life knowing that my mom would have to try to survive that. And uh, it's, it's hard to talk about even to this time because it's just, you know, um, and I just remember like I, I lost God when my dad died. There was just something about it and something about the PTSD and the flashbacks that I sort of had to get rid of all the extra and only what was real is what I could see and what I could hear and what other people could see and what other people could hear. So, and I kind of just got mad at God or the universe or whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and in that, since my dad died, there were two times when I, I talked to something bigger than me when I went back to that, because I just felt like I had no other choice. Uh, and one was when I asked for help and the next day was on a flight and literally meant next in the next seat to me was my, excellence coach and mentor that's literally helped give me back my life and the other time was when I was in the suicidal depression out at my mom's house um, on the ocean and I I just started to make this this bargaining it was like I was in a grief process with my own life and I just I just said like if if you get me through this I will go back for the others like just get me through this like just help me get through this and I promise I will go back for the others and so it's this deal I sort of had with myself that if there was some way I could get out of sort of this lack of light that I was stuck in um, and this sort of chronic pain and all the things that were attributing to me, like literally looking at my quality of life and, and making sort of scary decisions, um, 
that as soon as I could, that I would, I would go back for the others. And, and so when, you know, I finally did come out of that and I went from a place where I was a 95% in pain and, and, you know, to like 5% and just things started to resolve and I started to work through the trauma again. And I really did find joy and light again in my life. And just as I sort of was going back to my, what my, what I thought my life would have been before the accident, you know, just kind of going back in and sort of with a, a lot more purpose and meaning, but, you know, how can I get it back? COVID hit. And then it was like, okay, so that's not available. And it literally took kind of shutting down the whole world around me after I'd finally just gone, you know, invited back into it, um, physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally. Um, and then, you know, Tether and Matt came to me with this idea and, um, and it was just like, okay, here it is. Like it could not be more clear, you know? So that's, um, it's so weird. And that's why I kind of said at the beginning, like I, I just always try to look at each of these traumas and each of these losses and find where they can be a supportive opportunity. And when I say support, I mean in the spirit of peer support, meaning that both to me and to others, um, not, not a savior complex or not, you know, about doing something bigger and more positive than the negative that's happened to you. I think that can be, you know, overachieving can be just as bad as a drug addiction. If, if it's being used for the wrong reason, I can speak to that. Um, but yeah, it just, um, it just was in perfect alignment and to, to get to step out the way I did and, and to start to build what we've built as a peer, as one of the guys and take that as far as it can go. Um, it's just been, honestly really really cool just inspiring every single day and just just witnessing and seeing the community grow and you know this this really start to happen like i said something that didn't exist something that wasn't available to my dad certainly not in his back pocket on a phone like something that you know he wouldn't I wouldn't be able to explain to my dad now. It'd be like calling from the future and, and explaining like some sort of new vehicle. Like what, like the fact that it's an app that it's on your phone that you had access to other men. Like, you know, this is all something that just didn't exist. Uh, and I know because I looked for it for a long time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's been really cool. Well, there's, there's so much to unpack there. Um, you know, we almost just glossed over you losing one of your best friends. Um, and uh, I just there's a couple of directions that we can take, um, right? Because you, you, you experienced a similar position that your dad did, which was you, um, you were now in a, a depression where you started to have conversations with yourself about taking your own life. Um, and that's a very scary, obviously, place to be in. And one thing I'm wondering is that because you've gone through this, because you, you've you know, obviously didn't experience it the same way that he did or that anybody else will you experience your own version of that. Um, you know, what would you what would you say to people that may be experiencing that right now? Because it sounded like there could have been nothing more useful that you could have done nothing more helpful than just completely um, giving up trying to take care of yourself, but instead just sending it out there to your mom and saying, Hey mom, like I can't take care of myself right now. I need you to be here for me. I need to actually be in your house as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is beautiful. And um, I want to congratulate you on the, the strength that it takes to do that. Cause right from the beginning of this conversation, we've been talking about the traditional view of masculinity would never have allowed you to do that mm -hmm. because you yeah. would have felt like a burden you would have felt like you were weak. You would have felt like a liability. And maybe you are all those things. But when you're, when you're in a crisis, what's your other option? Mm -hmm. and when you're I, in a and crisis, what are you going to do? Take it on alone? Yeah, exactly. And I tried. Trust me, I tried. I, I, I really felt like all of those things. And I really put it off as long as I possibly could. Um, but again, in, in sort of what saves me and my story is the fact that I lost them. And by that fact, my family did. And it, there was something about the idea of my mom having been through what she's been through already, having to lose me that just was such a strong, strong force. And like, you know, I, I was at a point, like I, I 
I will never forget, like asking my therapist, I just started crying my eyes out and, and he was like, what's wrong, what's wrong, what's wrong? And it's like, I, I just wish you could call my mother and my sisters and you could explain to them how much I'm suffering. Cause then I think that they would be okay if I wasn't here anymore. Like that's where I was at, where I like, maybe, maybe you could call them, maybe you could explain to them like why I feel this way. And that if something happens that, you know, it would be, it would be a release. And like, that's obviously where it became very serious that that's where, you know, that that's where that is. But it, just to get back to your question of anybody who's listening, I would just say that as much as you can try to let go of that fear of what saying out loud what you're feeling will ignite or start in your life around you um, and just start with one person. My life's been saved twice by being able to tell one safe person the absolute truth and many times since then uh, in micro ways. Um, and allowing that energy to dissipate um, and sit with them and feel safety and then make decisions the same way you would with any other medical condition, the exact same way. Um, just if you had a broken arm, you wouldn't try to do surgery really quietly in your room and, and see if it's okay, you know, without any, any expert help. And you certainly wouldn't put it to just a friend who's not a surgeon either or just a parent, you know, there's there's so many resources out there and I, I want to normalize the fact that one of the hardest things for me to ever do, even in this state when I was making all these other decisions, was to call a helpline, to call a hotline. Uh, and I did, I did the day that my mom went out one day and I just realized how unsafe I was. And so I, I decided to call um, a hotline um, just to see if it would help. And, and I have to say it, it it still, that day still remains to be one of the biggest points of education for me of where my own mental health and my spectrum is. Like, it, it, it's not this big scary thing where if you admit how you're feeling, like there's this SWAT team that comes down and straps you down and like, it's actually quite difficult to get help. It's actually, you know, it's like, if anything, that's what we're working towards with Tether is, is making it more accessible. So being an advocate for yourself and being able to, to speak up um, and call a number, it's really, it's just more about the education point. And for me, you know, what happened on that call was I realized there's sort of like a whole, a rating system basically of suicidality and to figure out where you're at and, and, and what to look for. And, and I found out that out of one out of five, I was only, I was at a one, you know, and I thought I was at a five. So I was scared by, by my own misconception of suicidality, you know, it was like, but the reality was I, I didn't have a plan. I didn't intend to do anything that day, you know? And so it was as, as wild as it felt inside of me and as, you know, broken as I felt, I found out that what I was feeling and how I was thinking was actually quite normal. And then obviously even more so with having been a suicide survivor, you know, um, uh, sorry, a survivor of suicide loss with my father and myself, uh, and a few other suicides in my family during those years, um, you know, of course I would think about it all the time. And of course I'd be calculating whether or not this is a decision that I would make or, or not make and sort of be obsessed with it. Um, and, um, you know, just, I just like, it's one of those things where you have to really think about if you were talking to one of the biggest things during that time that I go back to is, I started writing letters to my unborn son. Uh, and I would call, it was like the file on my computer was called Before I Was Your Dad. And I just tried to start to put things into a way that I would speak to my child to explain them to myself. Because like we talked about earlier, I was not in a place to be kind enough and compassionate enough with myself and my own self-talk. So I started to write them to my unborn son. Um, and in doing that, I just, I realized so much about the way that I would explain the situation and, and, and seeing and reading what I would write to my unborn son about how I was feeling at that time gifted me so much back because it wasn't my narrative of me being hard on myself and me, you know, sort of being in this dip. It's, it, it took me out of myself to, to try to explain it and it normalized it. Like, yeah, a lot has happened, Addison. Yes, like, you know, just like you would talk to a child, but, you know, I, I couldn't tap into that love for myself at the time. Um, and for me, I really found it in involving other people and, and, um, and you know, making sure that I wasn't alone if, if deep in my heart I was the most afraid of being alone. 
which was very hard to do because I didn't want to be a burden and I, I didn't think I would pass and it would go away. And it, it was just the, you know, the worst part of my life, obviously. Um, and I just, um, I don't know if, if anybody is feeling anything like that. All I can say is that, you know, you're, is there's a reason that cliches become cliches but you're not alone you're definitely not alone and i've i've kept my deal and gone back for the others so if you're a man listening you know there's there's crisis resources of course if you're in crisis and, and tether and by no means is for someone in crisis uh because we leave that to the professionals we are just peers but if you need to start with you know a compassionate group of men who who are able to listen and are available and you can sort of drop in and see how other support and and get supported and you know that that's something that you can witness right now and that's something that that is the good out of the story that I'm telling in that sense that 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 can exist for other guys um because it again it didn't uh for my dad and it didn't for me um and um yeah I'm just I don't know it's weird as I, I've never really put it together this way so as I'm saying this I'm just realizing that it's it's really cool that Matt came to the the people he did, myself and the other co-founders with the vision and and it sort of has built from there um, and that I get to be a part of that. Um, so yeah, I just- uh, You and your team you should know. be really proud. Really proud. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's so many nuggets of wisdom that you shared there. Um, you know, the first one being that parallel between your physical health, right? Um, you know, I've done speeches for youth mental health education for many years. I mentioned Eric Windle. I mentioned Jack.org. Um, I was going into high schools and universities since 2017 to talk to youth about mental health education. We always describe a spectrum for your mental health, right? The conversation we have is not, do you have mental health or not? It's where are you on the spectrum in any given moment? Like we've talked about on this, on this podcast, which is honoring where you are in your journey. You might be from healthy, you might be stressed, you might be struggling, you might be in crisis. And depending on where you are, you could take advantage of different resources available to you. So like as an example, um, when you're healthy and stressed, that's when you would typically practice self-care, like the things that you would do that make you feel good and empowered and in flow, like you're talking about like meditation, exercise, sleeping well, things of that nature. When you start dipping into this realm of struggling, um, you know, stress and struggling is where peer support is really useful. Having dialogue is really useful. Having a professional like a therapist is really useful because that would be like the equivalent of like you said, like breaking my arm. I would never go back to my apartment and try to like do surgery on my own arm, brace it up, fix it, and then and then walk back into the world. That wouldn't work that way because there's no stigma with our physical health. Right. And I, I do want to say too, when you say that, because sometimes that also gets misconstrues when it comes from the peer support lens of I'm not a professional so hands off uh, one thing that I that we educate like the brand works to educate everybody on is to say uh, the same thing is that 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 a broken arm metaphor the same thing you would do as a friend I can be here for you before during and after as a peer anything you need to do with professionals I can be here before during and after you know you're not alone and I I'm I will sit beside you I, I love that it on speaker it's so important to put that part in there because we also don't want this like hands-off isolation thing right um because it's like leave it to the professionals but also just the same normalize it the same way you would like we're talking about with your physical health in any other way you know pre-covid of course someone would come to the hospital with you would sit there would wait would help you with the things that you don't need to be doing like all of that still exists there and i also love what you're saying too because i've, I've had the privilege of interviewing hundreds of men through the app and one thing that is so interesting is when i say like tell me about your mental health journey is a lot of men especially you know men who are maybe 10 years older than me and on will say, well, mental health really started for me in college or mental health really started for me after my divorce or when my child passed or, you know, and you're kind of like, like, did your, when did your physical health start? <laughs> like, you know, it's like, you know, but, but that's really the way that men were taught to think about it, that it's something that you have and somehow it's inherently negative. And, you know, I don't need to be a sociologist just by, by talking to men all the time, I can tell you that, you know, that is something that seems to be inherent, this idea that mental health 
is a negative thing that needs to be tended to if something is wrong with you. And it, it, it makes no sense because it's the same as physical health. Mental health would be you, you are healthy. You know, mental health could be you are in flow because you, you're a part of that process. Um, but somehow it seems like, you know, it's like mon mental unhealth is almost what or whatever it would be, you know, is what they're, what, how they perceive it. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and again, one of the things that I want to acknowledge from what you said prior is that it was so crystal clear that, um, you know, the peer to peer model, I love how you said that I can be there for you before, during and after. And you make a great emphasis on the Tether app of um, reaching out to a crisis line. It's very obvious where it is on the app. Um, you have a bunch of different options. It makes it easy for them to be able to connect with those people. And so I, I want to just let you know that I think that's fantastic. Because like you're saying, sometimes it's not very easy to be able to access these resources. And especially when you're in crisis, when you're out of control and you're not thinking uh, as rationally or logically as you typically would or at all, um, having it at that accessible, I think is really useful. And so, like I said, I think it's God's work, man. I think you guys are doing a great job. You should be really proud. Um, the last theme that I wanted to talk about on this show was addiction. Hmm. Because it, it seems to be a real challenge for men and it does play into our mental health. And as I was going through some of the threads, um, alcohol and different drugs continue to resurface as a theme. And so I'm wondering, you know, in these conversations with men, what have you learned about substances or addictions? Or, um, you know, one of the things that I'm reminded from earlier in this call, sometimes we, we, you know, we create other problems to avoid and distract ourselves from bigger problems. So I don't know if that plays in, but I was just wondering in your eyes, how do you see addiction playing into our mental health? And, um, you know, this peer support model, obviously it works for AA, um, for Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, you know, dramatically successful. Absolutely. Can you talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, how you think about that? Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, I will say from my own experience first that, there's n that's not what I'm going to say. <laughs> I was going to say there's no one who knows the use of vices better than me, but that's how everyone's going to feel. Like. And you're, you're only the expert of your own experience. But what I mean by that is that I juggled a lot of different things in order to not feel what I was feeling. And like I said, in a very unhealthy way, overachieving was a big part of that. So I was also championed uh, for my unhealthy habit of, you know, overdoing to not feel. Um, so I do resonate with everybody who I do get to meet uh, on the platform that struggles with addiction, um, and I'm very inspired by them. And I actually, I, I really admire the strength to be able to really identify something that's not serving you and work towards eliminating it from your life and, and you know, finding sobriety, because that's something that even I struggle with, because, you know, like I said, when you're juggling, it's, it's very hard to pinpoint you know, what's really not serving you. Um, but as far as, you know, in a broader way, I, I think addiction and obviously what's been going on in the States here with the opioid crisis and, you know, just in general for years, I mean, I think that numbing and finding something to cover up what we're feeling, the pain we're feeling and what we're going through, you know, if I said, this is what a man is and it's stoic and removed and strong and, you know, appearing to not feel, and then like over here, there's all these substances that, that can appear that way and numb you. You know, it, it's no surprise to me that there's, you know, a very unhealthy marriage that exists for many men in their mental health between substance abuse and trying to navigate what they've been through and what they're going through. Um, and I do think that many people, you know, who have gone through AA really also love Tether because it's, it's the same idea and the same community and the idea of checking in and the peer support. And, and when you walk in, you know, everybody's kind of, it's guys who get it, guys who want to be there, guys who, you know, you can be doing something so, so normal with, you can meet up with, but if you need to stop and get emotional or talk about something or whatever, you know, there, there's not going to be a barrier. They're going to be down for it because you met in this, in this container. Um, and I think that, that also, you know, I've heard friends that are on the app as well, confident, Confid confidentiality, huh? confidently tell me um, that um, 
that there's something nice about having that same type of environment almost as a next step after AA where, you know, it's that same feeling, but it's not so structured around the substance abuse specifically. Um, but yeah, you know, it, I find addiction fascinating and, and not in any way to glorify it, but it is something that I'm constantly trying to learn more about. And, you know, for the sake of the community and just as a peer, how I can be supportive to those who also have that, you know, compounded, just the way I sort of have PTSD compounded on my regular mental health journey. Um, you know, and that's one of the things that I really love about Tether is that everyone does get to be, like I said, the expert of their own experience. So, you know, I really get to dive in and hear from a story driven place, what addiction has been for this person, but mostly and most importantly, through that person of who they are, not just like this idea of stigmatized addiction, but as a human being who struggles in whatever way, and you know, it becomes the person's name and their story versus this kind of broad idea of people who are addicted or have addictions. Um, and um, the more, like we said in this conversation again and again, the more you put a face to it and the more you learn about someone in their story, you realize how many points in their story are so similar to your own and you see how, how not how not difficult it would be for you to end up in a similar situation uh, if, if the same opportunities presented themselves at the same time or the same lack of opportunities. And that's the other thing for anybody who's listening to this, you know, this was a much more deeper dive, I feel like, for men's mental health. And I, I do want to say that, that I am, you know, I am privileged beyond belief. I had a great upbringing, a very strong education. You know, I'm, I'm white, I'm privileged, I'm educated, and I struggled so much to navigate through finding the help I needed in my mental health journey. And that's one of the reasons that I definitely wanted to go back and see what I could do. Because, I mean, I'm telling you, I know I could have been a doctor, a lawyer, a judge, whatever. And there were times where I just couldn't figure out how to get the help that I needed. Um, and I enlisted the help and the brain power of so many amazing people to get to where I am now. So there's no shame and no stigma in feeling lost, even if you are willing and you are ready to participate. Uh, that's something again and again that gets driven home at Tether. And there is no shame in that. And there is no question that's stupid. You know, you're out there and you've got to find the best for you, you know. Um, and uh, if I can be of any help in doing that um, by sharing my story, then I'm, then I'm always happy to, for sure, because I know that feeling. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate you acknowledging that. Um, I really do believe that taking the risk of reaching out for help is one of the bravest things that we can do because it is very counter culture. It's very counter the narrative of what we believe masculinity is. And so I want to uh, just um, acknowledge that you've done that over and over. And that sounds like just sparking a conversation, beginning the conversation, ongoing conversation. It seems like one of the, the best things you've done for your mental health. So um, just encouraging those that are listening to uh, begin the process, if you haven't already, of culti cultivating relationships where that can be on the table, right? Mm -hmm. And so I uh, just, again, thank you for doing that. I, I kind of want to wrap up with, um, you know, just uh, reading something and then asking you one final question. Um, I wanted to read... I found this online. There are many five-star reviews. So if you're wondering if Tether is something that you uh, would get value from, this is what some people are saying about it. They say, it's no understatement when I say this app has changed my life for the better. Prior to Tether, I had no support structure in my life. These men have welcomed me with wide arms, allowing me to be strong on good days and weak on bad ones without the fear of judgment or loss. Uh, the kindness and passion of men, both in the community, on monthly calls, and even from their staff has been astounding. The app has room to grow, but the community is well worth any bugs I've found. Um, I thought that was beautiful. I thought that was honest. And uh, there is just like 
positive review after positive review after positive review. So it just sounds like, um, you know, what you two, what your, your team is up to is, is being well received. I see it as something that's absolutely necessary and making a difference in the world or else I wouldn't have uh, called you on here to, to, to be on the, the call. I think you're an inspiring dude. I think what your team's up to is phenomenal and aligns with my purpose and the, the direction that I want to take the conversation around men's mental health. So thanks for doing this. And I, I want to just give you an opportunity to share anything else that's on your heart, anything you're called to share with our listeners. Uh, this is a, a challenging time. Um, you know, we've been experiencing what's been called a global pandemic for the last year. I don't think men and people have ever been lonelier. I don't think people's financial situations have ever been more desperate in my lifetime anyway of what I've seen. Um, you know, just not having the social connection that I'm that we're typically used to, or that that dynamic of um, touch and comfort and mutual acknowledgement of each other. You know, we seem to be more guarded and separated than I've ever seen in my entire life. And so, um, in a time when conversations about mental health have never been more important, I'm just wondering if there's anything else that you wanted to share uh, with our audience. Yeah, I think that one thing that's always really stuck with me that my mentor used to say to me jennifer merrifield if you guys want to look her up because she really did change my life um what you focus on expands and so part of what we did today was do a deep dive into my own mental health journey and obviously we deep we, we went deep on a lot of the low moments but one thing that I do want to say is essential for me and if you're listening to this for you to go and I invite you to do this once you finish is to take a breath and despite everything I just shared and despite everything that I've been through I really do want to drive home that I remain fully believing that I am one of the most lucky human beings on earth because of the, con the community that I've been able to cultivate and the people that I've met and the people who have made sure that I was here today to do this. And um, I, I spend so much of my time making sure that, you know, like she said, what you focus on expands. So I do, outside of speaking like this, you know, have such, such an important focus around what, what I'm grateful for, what I appreciate, what's happening in the present moment. And even though I could focus on the actual losses, what, what I learned and how I learned to love as a result to what's happened to me um, is where my wealth is. Um, and I, um, I just, uh, I invite you to not let my story be the opening to the times you've maybe felt as desperate or as low as me. Take that acknowledgement, take that inside that you're not alone, but then also please accept my invitation to go to the moments in your life where you've been the most connected because those are the ones that will give you the energy to drive you forward um and those are the ones that that make you feel a little bit more brave and a little bit more strong to ask for help and share yourself uh there's there's nothing special about what i did today it's just the practice of being able to share and um and like you said at the very beginning um if you're a man and you're listening to this and any of this has resonated um or whoever you are, struggling doesn't make you any less, you know, it, it just makes you human. So you get that check mark and, and we go from there. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm, I'm very accessible on Tether too. You can reach out, you can DM um, through there and uh, yeah, just uh, honor the journey. What you focus on expands. If you struggle, it doesn't make you any less of a man, it just makes you human. Go out there, honor the journey, man, beautifully said. Uh, Addison, I really appreciate you being on the show. I know the Circle Up community is going to benefit a lot from this conversation, and I'm going to do my best to uh, keep honoring my truth and uh, bringing everything we've talked about uh, back into my life, especially all the things I'm grateful for. Because, uh, goddamn, man, um, you know, I'm I got to be one of the luckiest people in the world too. Yeah, so, and share them on Tether, man, because it's it's that's the my favorite part of Tether. Everybody, you know, it's not somewhere you just go when you're having a bad day, it's when guys come on on the good days. I mean, it gives us all just the fuel. We celebrate so much in there and I love that. So yeah, don't be afraid to celebrate.
What's up, y'all? Nine months after the recording, I'm here in Mexico City and ready to bring to you the episode that Addison and I did about tether, about men's mental health, about grief and addiction, and how you can put yourself in a position to care for other men, to be cared for by other men, to normalize this conversation of asking for help. Hey, I'm not doing well. Hey, I need support. Hey, can you be there for me right now? And, I, and I'm regretful in many ways that it took this long for the episode to be available, but I am stoked with how it turned out. I'm stoked for Addison's gift that he shares, which is his presence, his experience, and uh, what he's been able to glean from those experiences. And I think that if the only thing that this episode does is it encourage you, encourages you to either A, today, put yourself in a position to cultivate a relationship or relationships or become part of a community like Circle Up or Tether or Everyman or Sacred Sons or any of these other communities designed for men to be able to come together, then it'll have been worth it. And uh, if, especially if you're struggling today, reaching out for help is the strongest thing you could do. So encouraging you to do that. Thanks for Addison for being patient with me um, and for being just such a superstar advocate for men's mental health and uh, for the whole team at Tether for doing the work that they do and putting this out in the world and making it available to men. We appreciate you. Uh, to the listeners, as always, love y'all. Thanks for making this possible. Share this with a friend if you got value. Subscribe if you got value. And in the meantime, until next time, don't circle up. You know, it's funny how that happens. You feel like you're at a flow and you're doing things phenomenal. And then all of a sudden brain fart, it's cool, just woke up. Don't man up, circle up. Till next time, don't man up, circle up.